Happy Water Awareness Month from the Arizona Department of Water Resources. I want to quickly remind participants to mute yourselves during the presentation so we can hear the presenter. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. So during that time, I would encourage anyone interested in asking something to unmute yourselves or just ask your question in the chat and we will read it for you. This webinar is being recorded and we will be shared through the ADWR YouTube page for those who missed it. I will provide a brief water awareness month introduction and then we can continue with the webinar. The Arizona Department of Water Resources and your water conservation partners from around the state invite you, your family, and your neighbors to join in the celebration of Water Awareness Month, or WAM, as we like to call it. The WAM website first launched in 2011 and is overflowing with ideas and activities to help you learn more about water conservation and become more aware of our state's most precious resource, water. The availability and quality of our water supply is critical to the quality of life. Therefore, this essential and precious resource was rec recognized by the Arizona governor in 2008 with an executive order that designates April as Water Awareness Month. Many thanks to Arizona's water awareness partners from around the state who contribute events, tips and resources to the website, and help promote water awareness. Next, I would like to introduce our speaker. Ken Sliwa, or Gecko, who is presenting today's webinar titled H2OMG, Summer is Here at Arizona State Parks. Gecko has worked at Arizona State Parks for eight years as a community relations administrator, working with parks, communities, and partners across Arizona to spread the joys of outdoor recreation and teaching people the difference between regional, state, and national parks in our state. Always a challenge. He also manages the website, social media image curation, and provides graphic design support for marketing parks to the public. He has lived in Illinois, California, Colorado, Texas, Louisiana, Maui, Hawaii, St. John's of the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Arizona. Gecko, thank you very much for joining us today. Take it away. Hello, and welcome to Arizona State Parks and Trails. Uh, my name is Gecko, as she said. We'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to sit here with you today and uh, tell you a little bit more about state parks. Uh, summer's coming, the water aspects. We are overflowing with uh, information about water related activities at state parks um, to, to coin a phrase for water. Um, so I wanted to give uh, everyone an overview here. Not sure how many people have been out to the state park systems. Uh, we do have a great diverse uh, system in Arizona with uh, deserts and forests and mountains and the water and lake areas. So uh, for people that aren't from Arizona, it's uh, pretty unusual to know that we've got more than 120 lakes in Arizona um, and that we have so much water uh, sports and activities that go on out here and just how important water is um, to uh, the desert and all of our um, uh, people that live here, but much less uh, to tourism and you know, bringing people out from all over the world. So thank you. Um, you can go ahead and move the, move the slide there. Next slide, there we go. So um, Arizona's, uh, Arizona State Parks, just for reference, another state agency, our mission is to manage and conserve Arizona's natural, uh, cultural, and recreational resources for the benefits of the people uh, both in our parks and through our partners. Um, Arizona State Parks started in 1957. So we are the last uh, state in the US to get a state park system, uh, mostly because Arizona was kind of late to the game uh, becoming a state. Um, conveniently enough, uh, because of that, our, our parks are located kind of all over the state in almost all four corners uh, between uh, Mexico, New Mexico, California, and then up to Flagstaff. Once you get above Flagstaff, you've got a lot of national park, Native American land, state and federal land. Um, and the reason that the parks are kind of so spread out like that is because Maricopa County Parks started two years earlier. And they were able to kind of get the, uh, the, the ball rolling on uh, starting a lot of park systems within Maricopa County. So it's the only county we don't have a state park in. Um, so a lot of people are more familiar with places like Saguaro Lake and Bartlett and Canyon Lake and places that are a little bit more uh, closer to the central Phoenix maybe area, uh, but within Maricopa County or, or closer. Um, so this kind of helps to give you a little bit of a background uh, to where state parks are located 
And then kind of to lead into some of that introduction, a lot of people also don't know the difference between uh, regional parks, uh, state and national parks. They think, oh, I have, um, I have a Maricopa pass or I have a Red Rock pass or I have an NPS pass and I can get into everything for free. Um, Arizona is one of the, the few states too that doesn't have a, uh, uh, a DNR, a Department of Natural Resource that kind of consolidates some of those different uh, resources uh, like a lot of states do. Um, so the, the, the confusion about who owns what and which pass do I use and which system is being utilized is pretty prevalent, especially with uh, all of the out of state visitors that we get um, to our park system, but also, you know, having the second most uh, popular national park in the country um, and a lot of beautiful areas uh, to see in Arizona. So uh, part of what we do is also just educate people as we go out and do outreach and let them know that uh, the state park system is 33 parks that are unique. Uh, since 1957, there's 22 national parks and monuments. There's a whole bunch of other regional parks and systems. Um, and one of the other um, big things that we help share with people is that Arizona state parks are also unique in that we don't get uh, state tax dollars or state funding specifically to operate our parks. So the parks operate as a business. Um, so when people pay admission to get into a park, they pay for a tour, they camp, they buy a T-shirt. That money goes back directly into the park system to repair the sidewalks, the fences, to keep the parks clean, um, open and safe, and to protect those resources, the water, the land, um, everything that we're responsible for in those parks. So uh, the more people that come out to visit the parks, the more uh, revenue and resources that we have to be able to put back into the system uh, to make sure that they stay um, uh, amazing places to visit for, for many generations. Um, to come out and enjoy. So just to give you a little bit of background, Arizona is kind of unique like that. Uh, next slide. Um, so just a little bit of an overview. Uh, as I mentioned, we protect and preserve uh, the land and the water and the areas within our park system, uh, more than 65,000 acres or 64,000 acres. Uh, we also manage the state trail system. So as you're gonna see, there's a series of, of large trails in the state. Uh, we provide grant dollars for communities around the state to build and maintain trails, do education, um, various projects that they can get grant monies for uh, to build facilities to expand opportunities for uh, the residents and visitors to the state. Um, so that's part of the outdoor uh, grants program as well. And then we also operate the, the SHPO or the State um, Historic Preservation Office that manages the historic buildings and uh, sites within Arizona, of which there are many. And then we also manage the off highway um, uh, system. So all of the side by sides, motorcycles, Jeeps, um, vehicles that go out and enjoy. We have more than 50,000 miles of off highway, off road trails in Arizona, and it, it generates about three and a half billion dollars in economic impact to the state of Arizona. So it's a huge um, division of state parks and a lot of resources that get used, again, for education, for building trails, for maintaining and protecting those trails, uh, repairs, things of that nature. So we kind of have a lot of different things under our hat, so to speak. Um, it's not all just about the parks. So we do a lot of different things uh, to provide services for all our visitors. Uh, next slide. Um, so we also like to refer to them as your parks. So um, while they're not uh, like the taxpayer supported parks, maybe of a city or a federal system, um, these are the parks for the people and we are preserving and protecting the water, the land, the, the resources uh, in those locations so that people can go out and enjoy them. Um, we do have to charge a fee for, for people to go out and do that. But again, that, that comes back to going back into the system to provide uh, resources to maintain and keep the parks operating um, safe and clean uh, so you can come out and enjoy them and your kids and so forth. So they are your parks. Go out and enjoy them. Uh, next slide. So there's a short video here, kind of gives you a little overview about some of the water activities. Have 12 different lake and water based parks out of our 33. Give you a little bit of a review of some of the different locations and activities that people do in those parks around the state.
So I'm hoping, without being able to see a show of hands, that lots of you have gone out and taken advantage of these parks. Um, again, uh, the shameless plug of our website. So go out to uh, azstateparks.com. You can get all the information about uh, where to visit the parks, maps, uh, make reservations, um, find out uh, all sorts of interesting things about some of the historic uh, museums and locations around the state. Uh, whatever your interests are, we've got great information on there for everyone. Um, so getting into uh, this is our system right here. So this shows you from Flagstaff down to the bottom of the state and then uh, from California or the west coast of Arizona, as we call it, uh, over to New Mexico. Um, as you can see in the middle of the map, uh, we are missing parks uh, in the greater Phoenix, Maricopa County sort of area. So we're we're sort of surrounding everything around there. And then you kind of have a little bit of a dead zone in the sort of southwestern part of the state. It's not uh, quite as hospitable for, for state or regional parks down there. Um, so we've got them spread out in a lot of small communities, which um, also provides a lot of economic impact for those communities. Uh, there's jobs, there's uh, discretionary money that comes in from lodging and gas and so forth. Um, so uh, Arizona State Parks are proud to be able to provide um, those resources and impacts for uh, the state for small and large communities alike um, to help bring people to their communities and showcase uh, the beauty all over the state. Um, one thing you'll kind of notice from the way these regions are set up, uh, the southern region is going to be predominantly a lot of desert based um, parks. A lot of your, uh, a lot of your cactus and dry hot areas are going to be down in the, the southern region. Uh, the northern region is going to have um, obviously higher elevations, a little bit cooler temperatures, and then you get into the mountains and the, the forests up there, which kind of change people's uh, attitudes of Arizona. It's not all just brown and green and desert and cactus. And then you got our, our beautiful western area. While the, the desert does open up and that area, it, it shows up with this beautiful um, uh, Colorado River along our west coast. And so we've got uh, four great parks along there that we'll talk a little bit about. For those of you that haven't had the chance to get out there, and then this map also shows some of the uh, the primary trail systems in the state. So you've got the the Arizona Trail going from New Mexico up to Utah, uh, the 800 mile trail that I've never gone on myself. I've gone on sections of it, but I've never gotten to complete that yet. It's a bit of a chore. Um, and then we have the Arizona Peace Trail, which is one of the newest um, OHV trails in the western part of the state. That's also an 800 mile uh, off highway, off vehicle trail. So there's a lot of great resources um, that you can find on the website with maps. You can also pick up at a park, one of our green guides, which gives information for all of the park systems uh, locations. And then there's also a great map in here that highlights what we're talking about here on the screen which parks you can visit that have camping, water, lakes, boating, fishing, et cetera. Uh, you can pick those up in the gift shop in our main office. We're located off of 11th Avenue in Washington. So we're just down the road from you guys. And uh, also at each of the park locations, if you head out there as well, you can pick up some great information. So let's go ahead to the next slide. We'll get into some of the individual regions here. Um, this kind of gives you another overview just really quickly. Uh, the recreation parks are considered our camping, a couple of our day use parks where you can do more specific water or, or land based activities. Um, we've got 8 historic and cultural parks, which include places like uh, tombstone uh, courthouse down south or the Reardon mansion in the north. So, historic buildings and museums. Uh, we have 3 environmental and education locations, places like Oracle state park in the south or red rock in the north that teach, um, have classes and programs that teach people about uh, maintaining the environment, uh, the geology, geography, the, the wildlife, the, the animals. Uh, it might be the historic information for those areas as well. Um, and then we've got three natural areas, places that are water specific, like uh, Sonoida Creek, Verde River, uh, that we also manage and protect. Uh, we have that one state recreation area, so it's not considered a state park, but it is Fool Hollow uh, Lake Recreation Area up in Sholo, and that's managed through a partnership with some other agencies. And then we have one memorial park, uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, it's the Granite Mountain Hotshots Memorial State Park. Um, I was fortunate enough, uh, starting here eight years ago, to be involved with this project from the beginning uh, to help create a park to uh, remember the memory of the hotshots that we lost in the fire. 
Um, so I helped to, to build and work with the families uh, to design and create this park. And uh, we've welcomed uh, more than 120,000 visitors to the park uh, since it opened in November of 2016. And I encourage you, if you haven't had the chance to go up there, to please go up and hike. It's educational, it's it's physical, it's emotional, but it, it gives you the opportunity to go up and learn about what our wildland firefighters do, uh, the work that the hotshots did, and uh, to, to give your thanks and to remember them. Uh, it's a great memorial um, to the, uh, the the memory of those guys. Uh, so I encourage you to do that before it gets too hot or wait until uh, the fall here again. Um, and then, of course, uh, just some of the stats, we've got almost 1500 campsites, more than um, 57 cabins, more than 80 trails, 175 miles of hiking within the parks. And then again, the acres of land that you can um, enjoy as part of the state park system. So go ahead to the next 1, if you will. Um, so the southern region, as I mentioned, uh, the southern region is going to be hot still. It doesn't have the uh, the cooling and the elevation that some of the the northern uh, parks offer. Uh, but there are some beautiful locations down here. This map kind of shows you a highlight of all of the different parks in the southern region. But I've circled the ones that are going to be more water specific places where people are going to start flocking to here uh, this month and into the summer uh, as things heat up. So go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, the first of which is Karchner Caverns, and I think talking with the AZ Water Group here today, um, this is one of our most important water parks because water created the caves. Um, little drops of water through the Whetstone Mountains over uh, many, many years uh, created these beautiful limestone um, formations all throughout this cave system. So it was discovered in the 70s. And the, uh, the cave explorers kept it hidden and a secret and then worked with uh, state um, parks officials and the governor at the time to decide if it was possible to protect this resource and to develop it so that it could be uh, watched over. It is a, it's a wet living cave, so it's a little bit different than a lot of the cave systems around the country. Um, it is closed off. To, to help uh, preserve the environment of uh, 70 degrees and 100% humidity. So those of you that haven't had the chance to get down to Benson to see Karchner Caverns, you can go to the next slide. Uh, there's um, two great tours that go through there, beautiful um, formations you're gonna see. You're gonna learn a lot about the history, how the water created this environment, uh, the animals and the, the life that's been discovered um, through here um, in the system throughout the years. Um, and what they're doing to kind of continue to maintain and protect this resource uh, for generations. There's a great uh, discovery center with more information uh, down there. There's a movie about how the park was discovered. Uh, there's also uh, camping. You can RV and tent camp. There's cabins down there. So it, it makes a great uh, park. If you're interested in going to Southern Arizona, you can stay in a cabin, tent or RV, and then use it as a base of operations to move around the other parks in Southern Arizona. Uh, so you can go on the tour, you can go on a hike, and then you can kind of explore the surrounding areas. There's historic parks there and um, water parks, as we'll see with the next slide. If you go on to the next one here, uh, next one, sorry, more beautiful formations. Look what water can do. Um, so Patagonia Lake. So Patagonia Lake is located just a little bit uh, south of Karchner Caverns. Also, Tombstone is located down that area and also Tubac uh, Presidio, which is our first state park. Um, historic is located in that area. So if you're down there using Karchner as your base, you can uh, check out a bunch of other great park locations. Uh, Patagonia is really beautiful. It's one of our most popular parks, top five in the state. Uh, we do get uh, tons of families there. We got white sand beaches, beautiful crystal blue water. Um, there's some really unique um, things about this park. Uh, one of the Aspects that's similar, it does have RV and tent camping as well as beautiful cabins that overlook the lake. Um, there's also some boat in sites that you can, if you bring your own boat out, you can pull right up to the shore and there's campsites located along the uh, shoreline. But one of the things that I think is really cool, go to the next slide, please. Um, there's actually two islands on the lake. One of them is pictured here uh, that you can actually rent a campsite on the island so you can take your boat out. Uh, bring bring out all your gear. There's uh, picnic tables and campfire setups. You can have your camp set up there, and you can create your own little castaway experience. You have to bring Wilson uh, yourself, your your volleyball, 
Um, try not to uh, to get too crazy out there being all by yourself in the middle of this lake, but it's a really cool opportunity. It's kind of a unique thing that I don't think any other lakes in the state offer uh, where you can kind of have your own little private getaway like that. So it's a really cool spot. In fact, it uh, had to shut down on Easter Sunday because we reached capacity already. So there's only so many parking spots, um, so many so many people that we can fit into the park. So in terms of um, managing that resource, we have to to close the parks down sometimes in the summer, in the afternoon, or when they get too busy, so that we don't overtax um, that resource or the staff or the facilities. So, um, word of word of, of caution is if you're going to go out to some of these beautiful locations uh, on a weekend, you know you want to try to get out there early. Uh, you know, make sure you bring plenty of water and food, and you plan ahead. Um, you know, safety first. From that aspect, and if you're going to go out and enjoy um, water and be out in boats or swimming or fishing, uh, you know, make sure you, you're uh, providing the the right uh, resources for yourself to go out there and enjoy that for the day. You know, hats are good, lots of water to bring out in your water jugs, uh, you know, sunscreen and all of the important uh, Arizona summer things that we sometimes take for granted, uh, especially if you're from another part of the country that's not used to our dry cooking heat. So. Uh, next slide, please. And then again, um, this area is also really big with wildlife. So uh, the Patagonia area in Southern Arizona is really big with birding. Uh, they filmed a movie out there called the, um, uh, the the Big Year, the Long Year. I can't remember specifically, but it was about a, a group of guys that go out and, and do a birding competition, Steve Martin and Jack Black and uh, Owen Wilson. And they uh, try to to find the most bird sightings. And one of the locations they filmed in was down at Patagonia Lake, uh, where they have the elegant Trojan, Trojan, uh, which is a really popular uh, bird to sight down there. Um, that's uh, famous in the birding world, I guess, but um, beautiful location to go down, lots of great resources down there. And it also ties into the next park, if you go to the next slide. So, Sonoida Creek, this is one of our natural areas that we um, also preserve and protect. Um, the elevation is a little bit higher down here, so the temperatures don't get quite as high as they do in the, the open desert areas. But this is a beautiful area. Um, water comes in throughout the summer uh, with the monsoon storms, fills up the area, backfills the lake. Um, there's great hiking, um, uh, horseback riding down in this area, amazing wildlife. I go to the next slide. There's um, just beautiful scenic vistas in this area. It's just Gorgeous open land that's that's not developed, and there's a lot of uh, great uh, areas out there to kind of explore if you haven't been in this part of the state. So, if you're tired of seeing lots of cactus and desert and dirt and dust storms, head down to Patagonia and Sedona or Sonoida Creek to get some awesome um, green and inspiration and desert plants and colors to kind of uh, clear your palate before summer starts. Uh, so, go to the next slide. Um, another location, southeastern um, Arizona is um, in Safford is Roper Lake. So it's another great lake location of the 12 uh, lake, uh, river and stream type parks that we have. Um, they're also at a bit of a higher elevation. It's not quite the desert. It's not quite the mountains or the, um, or the, uh, the forest, but you do have Mount Graham up there. So there's some great areas to explore in that area. Uh, the lake itself, uh, there are cabins right on the water. If you go to the next slide, there's great boating and fishing at this location. You can rent one of these rustic cabins right on the water, bring your boat right up to the uh, to the shoreline and uh, enjoy a, a great weekend with family or friends down there. Uh, we get snow on the mountain in the winter. This is probably a little bit more spring or summer kind of photo, so it does green up and it's uh, a beautiful uh, part of the state that maybe doesn't get as much visitation from people in Phoenix. So we encourage you to to travel a little bit outside your, your comfort zone, more than one hour or so outside of the valley so that you can really take in um, some of the beauty that the parks offer around the state. Uh, the next slide, please. And again, if you're sitting in this cabin and you're swing and you had your boat pulled up and you were barbecuing and uh, you had this beautiful view watching the sunset, you know, there's there's uh, worse things that could happen to someone in the summer in Arizona than to be uh, in this cabin enjoying uh, a nice relaxing weekend. So something to consider if you're looking for kind of a different way to um, experience uh, the outdoors and water in the state. 
Uh, the air, the cabins are air conditioned. They do provide the ceiling fans, heat and air conditioning. Uh, these are dry cabins, so they do not have uh, bathroom facilities in the cabin, but they do have them in a, in a common area with the cabin uh, loop that's provided. Um, so there's not a kitchen. There are uh, uh, sleeping accommodations for up to six people and different configurations, bunk beds and separate bedrooms and so forth. Uh, people generally will bring out their coolers, do all their cooking outside, um, bring all of their cold items. There is a store uh, at these at the park as well, where people can purchase uh, supplies and ice and, and food and things that they need. So it does kind of give you a, a bit of a turnkey solution. It's a little bit more rustic than maybe a hotel room or a full a full featured RV uh, with all of the facilities. But it's a it's a good inexpensive way. The cabins start at I believe it's like fifty five or sixty five dollars and go up depending on locations and time of year. Um, for like I said, up to six people, so it's a great way to bring a group of folks out, your family, and um, enjoy the beautiful sights around the state. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's also part of our smallest state park. So Dankworth State Park has got one of the worst names. Uh, but it is a beautiful little location. It's a, it's a pond um, that's located just south of Roper Lake. Um, it also is really popular with giant fake uh, toy boats. Um, it's mostly for fishing. People will kayak or canoe. Uh, it's not really a swimming type uh, pond or water feature, um, but it's just connected to the system as part of uh, Safford's uh, state park uh, support. Uh, next slide, please. Does have great options. Um, for fishing and um, picnicking and things for the day. So if you happen to be in that area, that's a great place to kind of stop off if you're not staying at the park uh, specifically. Um, so Southern Arizona, like I said, has um, a little bit of diversity. It is gonna be warmer. The elevation's not gonna be as high. There's a couple of water options down south as you move uh, through the state. And the state park system, I know there's also some regional uh, lakes and water areas uh, that are operated by different um, systems, but that's what we offer kind of down in Southern Arizona for you to check out uh, a new part of the state if you guys aren't familiar. Um, for those of you that like to go west, go west young man. Uh, we've got some cool offerings along Arizona's west coast. So uh, Lake Havasu considered uh, and Colorado River is the west coast of Arizona. We also have a couple of great uh, historic parks down in Yuma. So if you're heading down to San Diego, you might want to stop through those and check them out. Those are some great historic, um, take you back to, to yesteryear of, of what happened in the state's development. But as you head directly west, you're going to uh, shoot right past Hot Shots. That's up in Yarnell. So that's about an hour um, northwest of Phoenix. And then the first park you're going to hit is beautiful Alamo Lake in the bustling town of Wyndon, Arizona. So I don't know how many folks have driven maybe past Wendon, but if, you, if you're adjusting your mirror or radio, you might pass the whole town and not even realize that it's really pretty small. Uh, but if you take a right as you're heading west, you're gonna head, <coughs> excuse me, right up into Alamo Lake. So hit the next slide for me, please. This is um, another great area. It's gonna be one of those lake and water areas that are considered um, outside of the, of the, the busier sort of, um, types of lakes and water areas for people to recreate in. So you're not gonna have to wait in line for, for getting in and out of the ramps. Um, there's plenty of campsites, there's cabins there. Uh, they do a lot of boating and fishing and have a lot of boating and fishing tournaments and events there. So it's a really popular spot, a little bit off the beaten track that people like to go to. It's also really super dark out there. So if you guys like uh, peace and quiet and dark uh, locations, you can really see the night sky open up out there. It's an awesome spot to go check out um, as you're heading west if you don't want to go all the way to the uh, to the Arizona border of, uh, of the Colorado River. So this is a great spot to check out. They also have beautiful spring flowers, as you can see in this shot. Um, and they do some other events out there because it is so dark. They do have star parties. They do um, um, different activities throughout the year. It's it's one of our really re most remote parks. In fact, these are some of those areas where you're not going to get a cell phone signal. So if you want to be cut off the grid, you want to bring the family out and get the kids off the phones or devices. This is a great spot because they're not going to have any service. So something to think about for people that, that don't want to be uh, connected the whole time and want to go out and enjoy uh, the beauty of Arizona. Uh, again, hiking, uh, swimming, boating, fishing, 
um, all of the, uh, the fun recreational activities at this location. It's also a big place for uh, off highway vehicles. So the whole area pretty much from sort of West Phoenix, as you get out along the carefree highway towards Wickenburg and out to Wyndon is a lot of off highway trails and uh, systems out there that people will bring their side by sides, motorcycles, Jeeps, go out and enjoy for the day. Um, come back to this park, hopefully at night, maybe uh, take a swim, go out and enjoy the, the cool waters and, and the beautiful uh, dark, quiet location of um, Alamo Lake. So something to think about for folks that are interested in doing off-roading and also some camping, fishing, boating uh, to enjoy the water out west. Uh, hit me another slide, please. This is our uh, one of our marketing folks here. This is Neil. He likes to go out and uh, and fish at every one of our lakes and waterways. He uh, does a lot of our social media uh, talks to folks. He's also um, on our podcast, and they talk to agencies and groups around the state and partners about things like uh, fishing, water safety, fire safety, um, outdoor recreation interests, uh, kind of across the board. Uh, but he's very proud of his fish pictures. He does the catch and release. And uh, he's kind of our, our uh, go to person to know uh, which fish come out of what lake and when the stock happens and where to go for the best, uh, you know, the, the best challenge, I guess, for all the different types of fish you can catch in Arizona. So Neil's another great resource and you can check him out um, on our website also and podcast or on social media. So something to remind you guys, if you're just looking for some more background and information about recreating in Arizona and state parks, check us out online. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, this is some shots. Some of the uh, the folks will go out. They'll they'll tow out their uh, their side by side, stay out in the cabin, go out and run around on the trails for the day. Come back, maybe do some fishing, and uh, cook up their meal in their cabin. So it's it's a great way to to kind of create a home base. It's safe and secure. Like I said, you've got air conditioning and heat. Sleeps up to six people. You can bring your other vehicles out, like your side by sides. Uh, RV, bring out some guests and uh, have a really great uh, outdoor adventure at some of these parks. Uh, let's go a little bit further west now. Next slide. So Lake Havasu, this is our most uh, popular park in the state, our busiest park. Uh, really from now through probably August or September, we're going to get the most visitors to this location. Um, more than a million people will visit, which is a third of the people that visit all the parks in Arizona will come out to Lake Havasu um, over the next few months. Um, obviously, it's got the, the history and the background of being a great spring uh, break destination, uh, depending on your age and what college you go to. Uh, but it's a beautiful uh, location, one of four state parks right along the Colorado River. Um, they do offer uh, RV and tent camping, and then this shot here shows a, an image of one of the 13 cabins that we installed recently. And these are the newer cabins. They're all ADA. Um, they've got um, a white sand beach that is a private area. It's separate from the rest of the camping facilities in the park. So if you're looking for kind of a, your own little getaway where you've got a beach and a lake and a cabin in Arizona, I mean, you wouldn't think that's a normal activity. So this is a great place to go and check that out. Uh, these are open year round. This is going to be the busy time for them. So keep in mind if you're looking to camp or stay or even visit some of the parks um, through the summer, weekends are going to be your busiest time, you know, early in the day. Try to come out early, come out during the week if you can uh, to avoid some of the crowds. Uh, we do get a lot of people from California and around the world that come out to Lake Havasu in the summer. Um, again, making it the most popular park, but there's uh, great hiking around there. There's also OHV trails in the area. Uh, the Arizona Peace Trail travels through this part of the, uh, the system. Um, swimming, boating, fishing. So um, they also do a lot of our um, annual events there. The, boat, the uh, balloon festival for Lake Havasu is there. There's music festivals, car shows, a lot of fishing and boat um, contests and shows go on out there. So. If you're looking for some fun things to do, take a take a nice three hour drive out west and check out some of the beautiful things going on at Lake Havasu. Let's do the next slide. <coughs> Again, excuse me, some of the fishing and uh, wildlife and apparently a shoe that's uh, fishing in the water. That might be a shoe, might be an ugly duck, I'm not sure. Um, but lots of uh, activities out there. Uh, next slide, please. 
And again, you can, uh, there's group camping areas, uh, camping areas that are open along the waterways, both for tents and RVs, in addition to the cabins. Uh, it's just a great place to have a picnic, do a barbecue. You can also go out for the day. Uh, you don't have to stay overnight. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to uh, to do different activities. You can rent different watercraft as well at this park uh, to go out and enjoy the water if you don't have your own boats, jet skis, et cetera. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out on the website. And it is kind of the, the crown jewel as far as uh, visitation, revenue, and sort of uh, focus. And then also, fun fact, they filmed the movie uh, Piranha 3D at Lake Havasu uh, back in the day. I don't know for sure if there's piranha in the freshwater lakes of rivers of Arizona, how that works, but um, it was a, a marginal B-movie at best, but uh, that's another claim to fame that's a little bit more fun to talk about than some of the, the crazy stuff that might happen during spring break. So uh, we're very proud of, of, of Lake Havasu. They got a lot of great things to check out there. So again, go out and see the park if you can. Next slide, please. Uh, right down the road from Lake Havasu and a little bit less crowded is Cattail Cove uh, State Park. You can see from this photo from the water here, um, small freshwater whales love the park um, as well as jet skiers. And there is a white sand beach here as well. Um, you've got camping, uh, RV and uh, tent camping. There are no cabins at this location, but it does have beautiful facilities, great access to the water. You're not going to be waiting in line as long as if you go to some of the more popular uh, destinations to get into the water. Um, this is a, a beautiful scenic area as you make your way kind of south from Lake Havasu back down towards um, Parker, which we're heading towards now. Um, so it gives you some different um, vantage points of what's along the, the Colorado there. And then you can wave at the people in California that one day, you know, this is, this is all gonna be a beachfront property if they have that big earthquake. We're going to have some amazing uh, land right on the Pacific Ocean. So something to think about. So go out and visit it before it happens or after. Um, you can um, go out and see the, the whales breaching and uh, go out and enjoy some great water activities there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, some of the, uh, this is up along one of the trailheads, some of the spring flowers uh, that grow up in this area. It's uh, looks very quiet there. That must be like a Tuesday, not quite as busy. Um, but again, a beautiful area to go check out if you haven't been all the way west in our state. Next slide, please. Um, white sand beaches, you got your ramadas with your picnic areas, palm trees. Um, you know, if you told someone this was Arizona, they might not believe you with, with beach and sand and, and water and mountains. They're looking for horses and cowboys and desert. So. Uh, another great place to take folks from out of town, people back east that aren't familiar with uh, all the diverse areas of water and land and uh, the geography of Arizona. So check that out. The next slide, please. Um, as you get a little bit further south, as I said, you'll hit Parker, Arizona along the Parker Strip. So depending on which way you go west, if you uh, start from a little bit further south, you can come up from Parker and make your way north to Lake Havasu, or you can just head straight to Parker and stop. Uh, again, another beautiful area along the Colorado, uh, beaches along this park. Uh, it doesn't have that deserty feel. It's kind of this weird uh, hybrid because of all the greenery located you know, near the water. Um, a beautiful location again rv and tent camping there's no cabins at this location um but they do have you know spots that are right close against the water here as well it's not as busy as the lake havasu area maybe some of the more local uh rivers or lakes in the phoenix or uh, maricopa area so it gives you an alternative if you're looking to to take a little bit more of a drive and just see a different vantage point different area of arizona this is a great location uh, next slide um, it kind of gives you a nice little overview of the area as the, the Parker Strip kind of has this curve where the, uh, the river uh, cuts around the park area, but it kind of gives you an idea. You've got a nice big spread out area that's California on the other side and wave at them for the time being. Um, we get um, a lot of people, uh, kind of the overflow. So if, if the Lake Havasu area is too full, a lot of the people will come down to the Parker area. It's got a very similar uh, feel to it without some of the crowds. 
Um, so just as a thought, if you're looking for locations to go over the summer and enjoy some water, you might want to uh, get a little bit out of the most popular places and give uh, Parker and the Buckskin area a try. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the, the big annual events they have down there, too, is called the Parker Float. So it's kind of the the west version of the Salt River tubing, and it's the most popular area for giant inflatable um, unicorns to come uh, make their appearance. Also, the uh, the size and complexity of a lot of the different um, inflatable objects down there is kind of mind boggling. This is a, a very small picture of, of who actually comes out, uh, the hundreds of people and all of their uh, inflatable apparatus uh, each year. So, uh, information for that is on the website if you're interested in um, blowing up a large uh, vinyl duck or uh, unicorn and heading down there for the uh, weekend. So, something else to think about when you're down at the Parker Strip, enjoying the, the beauty of the Colorado River and the surrounding area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right down the road, even more uh, Discreet than part than the Buckskin Mountain is River Island. So it's actually kind of a, an offshoot park of Buckskin. Uh, it's got a few uh, uh, less campsites, but you can RV and tent camp there as well. Um, it's got its own ramps, access to the water. A lot of people will go there again if the, uh, the more popular locations are a bit more crowded. You're going to be, uh, it's a little quieter down this way, a little bit less uh, traffic and getting in and out of the area and in and out of the water. So um, again, working uh, with uh, the other local agencies down there, you know, all of these parks along the Colorado, uh, the water based um, West Coast will, you know, promote lots of water safety, working with the local officials to uh, encourage everybody that's out there with uh, life preservers and practicing good boat safety and, you know, good common sense to make sure everybody has a, a safe and uh, enjoyable time when they're out enjoying our water in Arizona. So. Another option for you on the West Coast. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one doesn't look as watery and it looks a little less busy. So it uh, just gives you another kind of vantage point. Again, uh, you know, mountainous area, hiking trails, access to off highway vehicles, camping, and then you got the water is right there. You can see a little bit of that beach on the right hand side. Um, so, so something to, to let your kids burn off energy if you want to just let them run around, play in the sand, uh, play in the water while you guys uh, have a little barbecue and relax back on the shore. Just a great option for you um, if you're heading west. So next slide, please. And yet another one, I'm sorry, I had a lot of great River Island shots. Um, again, um, very scenic, uh, spring flowers, great hiking trails. And if you have a large RV or bus in some of the cases of these folks down there, um, plenty of space for you to go down and enjoy um, access to the water in Western Arizona. Uh, next slide. Uh, so heading north. So north is probably this time of year, certainly most people's uh, favorite destination in Arizona. You've got uh, five or 6,000 more uh, feet of elevation in most areas that are kind of close by. You're going to get 10 or 20 degrees cooler weather, depending on where you are. Um, obviously, the, the environment's a bit different. It's not as deserty. You've got options for mountains and uh, woods and forest areas. Um, so this kind of will give you a little bit of an overview of heading north. So it's not going to be quite as far for some of these locations as it might be to go south or west. So it's, uh, most people like to go north. As long as you don't have to drive on the 17 freeway, which is pretty much the only really good way to get up there. Um, so again, uh, plan plan early. Try to go, you know, during the week if you can. Um, obviously, Saturday mornings and Sunday nights, getting up and down uh, the freeway can be a bit treacherous. So, uh, be careful if you're heading up there, and uh, you know, plan accordingly. Uh, next slide. So, Dead Horse. I don't know how many folks have uh, been up to Cottonwood area. This is one of our other uh, cleverly named uh, state parks, along with Dank Horse. So Dead Horse is my second favorite. Um, Dead Horse was named by the family that actually bought the original land. Um, their kids found a carcass of a horse that had died on the property when they were out looking at it. And they, the kids said, you know, there's a dead horse and they wanted to name that the, the name of the ranch and the, the park that the, the parents had bought at the time and the name stuck. So, um, 
it's a beautiful location up in Cottonwood. You don't know you're in the city when you head up there. It's only about an hour and a half or less from most places in Phoenix. Um, it's got a series of ponds in here. So if you go to the next slide, please. You'll get an idea. This is kind of an overview. You got the Mingus Mountain in the back. Um, you got a, kind of an overview of the, the ponds itself. This is a bit more um, in the fall of, of last year. You get beautiful colors in the, the, the trees up there. And then just behind the yellow trees, you see that strip of green trees. That's actually the Verde River. So you have that nice green belt uh, running right behind the park. Uh, so the whole area is very uh, big with uh, wildlife. We've got a, a great pair of bald eagles that live up there. Lots of other great birding opportunities up there. Um, you'll see a lot of, of diverse wildlife. People will kayak, canoe, and fish in the ponds. And then, of course, you can go swimming or fishing or kayaking in the Birdie River as well. Uh, but it's a really popular close area. This tends to fill up all summer long. It's a bit cooler. Um, there are cabins there, um, RVs and tent camping as well. Um, you can also horseback ride, and it's really big for hiking and mountain biking. There's some great trails up there. Uh, if you haven't uh, been in that area and you're into that activity, I highly recommend you check those out on the website and take a look. Uh, you can just go up there for the day and ride for miles between Cottonwood and Sedona, all back in the, uh, the desert and mountain areas. So a beautiful location. Uh, next slide, please. And they also work really closely with the Verde River um, organizations that do the water support for the river. Uh, there is a Verde River Days event that goes on up there each year where they do free uh, fishing and teach people about conservation um, uh, fishing. They bring up different groups and partners from the area uh, that talk about the wildlife and the conservation efforts. So this is a really good close um, water and outdoor recreation based area that's got a lot of um, Things for everyone, really. If you want to rent horses for the day, just go up for lunch, do some great hiking or some fun fishing. It's a great close place that's not going to be as busy as maybe going to some of the more closer regional. Uh, lake parks in the Phoenix area and and apparently with every cabin, you get a free uh, kayak as well. So nothing wrong with that. Uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, um. In the northern area, the, the uh, environment does change. So you've got kind of some woods and mountainous areas as you get into Cottonwood, but as you go further east, now this is up in Sholo, your elevation is going to go up, the temperature is going to go down, and you've got trees and forests um, with these lake areas that are offering um, similar options for camping. Uh, but you're obviously going to be in a totally different uh, geographic sort of uh, climate area of Arizona than you might be used to. So if you're looking, <coughs> excuse me, if you're looking to do some uh, some different types of a little bit more maybe traditional camping where people that might live in other parts of the country that are more uh, mountainous or wood based camping, uh, this is the spot that we we tell people to go to. You get a great snow, beautiful scenery here in the winter. Uh, this is a, a picture more spring and summer of the, the lake area. Um, it's not a big, big lake, but they do have great boating and fishing there. You can rent equipment there as well. So if you just want to go out for the day, maybe rent a paddle boat or a small boat, you can go up and enjoy that with friends and family. Um, it's a great uh, day trip uh, to go up and check out kind of a cool corner of Arizona that maybe doesn't get visited quite as much as some of the more popular uh, locations. Uh, next slide, please. And this kind of gives you just an idea. If you showed someone this picture of camping and said, where is this? Nobody would pick Arizona. So uh, this gives you the opportunity to kind of get back into some of the more uh, traditional sort of feel of camping for people that might be from California or out west, uh, northwest, um, when you're in a state that is traditionally known for, you know, desert and cactus and cowboys. So this gives you an opportunity to kind of enjoy a different aspect of appreciating the land and the water and the resources that Arizona has to offer. Next slide. And again, Neil is uh, forever fishing. Uh, he's got way too many rods and uh, weekends on his, on his uh, hands. He has four daughters uh, and his wife uh, to take care of. So uh, to get him to go out and fish actually is kind of a fun, rare option for him where he's not always doing it with his family. So. This was actually during a, a work trip that we all took out to, to get some photos of the park and talk to the staff and the visitors there. Um, 
to get some uh, surveys out to folks about what they enjoy using at the park and then also take advantage of some of the great fishing up there. So keep that in mind if you're heading uh, into the north uh, eastern part of the state that Full Hollow and Sholo is a great destination. Next slide, please. Um, as you get a little bit south of that area, I don't know how many folks are familiar with St. John's. Uh, it's kind of at the bottom end of the Little Colorado up along the, uh, the eastern edge near New Mexico um, of the state. Um, higher elevation again, a bit, a bit lighter temperatures. Um, they do offer RV and tent camping, also cabins. These are the newer cabins again with uh, up to six people, air conditioning, heat. Um, you've got picnic tables and uh, bathroom and shower facilities and so forth. Um, this area is a little bit more open and rugged than the uh, the more mountainous areas of Sholo. Um, next slide, please. It does offer great uh, boating and fishing. Um, there's actually no speed limits on the boating on this lake because it is a larger open uh, lake, uh, more acreage, and so they do allow uh, water skiing, um, you know, jet skiing and speed boats and things of that nature on here. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the really cool things about this park is some of the petroglyphs in the area. So this uh, backs up to some of the Native American uh, reservation areas up in northeastern Arizona, and there's some really great history and um, archaeological areas that you can go out and, and check out, and there's educational information available at the parks um, as you get up into that area. Another one uh, located a bit north of there is uh, Hamalavi State Park that's up in Winslow. Um, up there in the Hopi land, they've got um, great uh, archaeological uh, sites that they've been doing uh, uh, work and digs on for many years, uh, additional petroglyphs and trails that you can go up and explore, some great history in that corner of the state and all up along the edge of uh, the eastern area of Arizona. So go up and check that out if you're looking for kind of a nice little mashup of old and new and some great relaxing ways to use the water and uh, outdoor recreation of Arizona. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then nothing would be complete without uh, highlighting uh, some of the beauty of uh, northern Arizona. So Sedona is kind of the, the go to along with maybe Lake Havasu is one of the top 2 most famous places in terms of uh, a general visit uh, in Arizona uh, beyond the Grand Canyon. A national park, by the way, the, um, this is a, a view uh, looking out uh, towards the, uh, the northern edge of uh, Red Rock State Park out towards Cathedral Rock. You got a, a great little mule deer down there doing a, doing a little uh, selfie. Uh, this is a day park, so this is different from most of the other parks we've looked at. This is no camping. It's just to come up for the day. Um, it is a protected and uh, educational environment um, based park, so they do a lot of programs that talk about uh, the water resources, the land, the animals, the environment. Um, as far as the protections that they offer there. So there's no swimming, there's no fishing, uh, no harassing the wildlife, uh, just enjoying the beauty of, the, of this area in Southern Sedona. Uh, next slide, please. There is some great hiking and mountain biking available in this area, and it does back up along the um, Oak Creek. And uh, there is no fishing or swimming allowed in the creek. However, I don't think it's in this slide deck, but uh, back in 2020, we got a call from um, the people that manage Beyonce and she wanted to film part of her Lion King video for the new movie um, in um, Sedona. So they wanted to, to go do that here in uh, Red Rock State Park in Oak Creek. So they closed the park uh, one afternoon sort of secretly and they brought in all their people and they did their, their presentation. And then they also went up to um, Havasupai Falls in the Grand Canyon and did a segment of the video up, up at the falls, which I had no idea were located in Africa. Uh, but the red rocks are beautiful. The falls are beautiful. It, it highlighted Arizona and, uh, you know, she is the queen. So um, she uh, helped provide some exposure and awareness to folks about uh, the beauties of Arizona. So we appreciated her coming out and doing that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it does offer an educational center, talks about the wildlife. There's a movie theater at this location too that shows regular films and they do have um, events and activities uh, throughout the year that help highlight the educational uh, conservation aspects of, again, the water, the land, the wildlife 
Uh, so if you haven't been up to Red Rock State Park, I encourage you to check that out. It's a lot less crowded than going up to uh, some of the more uh, popular trails, the Devil's Bridge or going up to Bell Rock or things like that, that might be uh, quite a bit more touristy, harder to park and so forth. Um, so this is uh, a little bit more accessible from the back end of Sedona with some great uh, views of the city. Uh, next slide, please. Um, those of you that haven't been um, to Slide Rock, um, it is one of our, uh, another one of our top five parks in the state, gets the most, uh, among the most visitation. Um, obviously, between this time now, as it starts to hit 100 all the way through August or September, um, pretty much every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, it's, it's pretty crowded up there. So we get a lot of people uh, going up to visit. Um, if you don't get up there early, there's probably going to be a line on 89A in both directions, people trying to get into the park, and there may be delays. Uh, we do manage the amount of people and parking that can get in um, at one time uh, to help manage the resource. Um, the, the, the creek itself is not in the state park um, land. It's part of the national forest. Uh, the park itself is located um, at the stairs and then the area all the way up to the mountains right behind the park, if you're familiar with the park. Um, but we do help manage and maintain uh, the water areas. We do cleanups. Uh, they do uh, ongoing water testing uh, there to maintain um, the cleanliness of the facility. And then one of my favorite parts of this picture, I came up and took this, I think a year or two ago before the pandemic. If you look towards the middle bottom of the photo, you see the kid in the blue shirt and the red pants. Um, he's falling down and apparently he didn't remember that the word slide is in the name of the park. And I saw him running across the water from the man on the right and he hit a particularly slippery spot and just fell right on his butt and I caught a picture right as he was falling down. Um, he got up, he was fine. He walked a lot slower to get to the other end of the, the creek. Um, there's no lifeguards on duty, so you do have to be careful, but um, people do take for granted that um, that it's uh, you know a fun place to go, but you can uh, can get hurt sometimes if you're not careful. Um, we also do encourage people to um, again get here early. Try to go during the week if you're interested. Um, we we do limit the amount of people, as I said, but it continues to be one of the most popular places to send people to in Arizona is Sedona and Slide Rock. Uh, we were recently highlighted as one of the top ten secret swimming holes in the in the country. Well, it's not a secret if it's on a TV show. It's a travel channel, so. Uh, now more people know about it than maybe didn't before and they want to come out and see it and uh, take beautiful photos here and enjoy the water. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the group uh, that's listening now, but uh, that's ruined a pair of shorts on the slide. Uh, so when you sit down in that 90 feet and it pushes you down through the water, it's really easy to uh, ruin uh, an old pair of jeans. So if you do go up there, enjoy yourself. Uh, we have a, an annual event up there, the fall festival that highlights the history of the park. Uh, the apple orchards, uh, some of the family members that were originally involved with the park are still uh, involved with the uh, the charities and groups that support the park and education. So, please do go up there and enjoy it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just gives you kind of a, a general yes. Hey, okay. hey, okay. uh, so it's already one. We will have some people who will need to leave, but oh, I'm we'll sorry. Give you a couple okay. more minutes to finish. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I will add this. some links into the chat. No, no, go past this, okay. uh, just some more pictures of Slide Rock, and then go down uh, just the Apple Festival. Okay, the last one, this is the last one we have, Tonto. So those of you that haven't gotten up to Prescott, it's about two hours northeast of the valley. Uh, you got Pine Creek uh, up in the Tonto National Forest. It's one of the largest, uh, we believe, travertine bridges in the world. Um, it's a great uh, elevation, a little bit cooler up there, great hiking and picnicking. Uh, next slide, please. You'll see this area has got some amazing wildlife. We just replaced the bridge that gives you access to the uh, to the cave underneath the bridge last year. Um, so there is water there. There's some swimming. We don't really encourage fishing or swimming at the park, but people do use the water. Um, and then all the way along Pine Creek. Uh, next slide. And then, of course, there's lots of great uh, javelinas, as the people from Minnesota like to say, that uh, don't know how to pronounce a lot of the Arizona words. So if you do see some of the beautiful wildlife, just take pictures. Please don't harass them. Uh, this is their park, too. Uh, next slide. Um, the Verde River actually was the last one. It's, um, so this is adjacent to the, uh, to the Dead Horse uh, property in Cottonwood. 
So this is one of our kind of premier waterways of, of the state. Amazing um, wildlife in this whole area, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. I mentioned the bald eagles, lots of birding in this area. Uh, the fishing, um, the water along the, the Verde is, is very um, utilized for lots of different activities. Next slide. Um, but again, a great place to go up and relax for the day, bring the family, do some fishing, kayaking, uh, just to relax and get a little bit of an escape from the, the summer temperatures in Phoenix. Next slide. Um, bring your family. You can also bring Groot. If you ask him if he likes Verde River, he says, I am Groot. That's all he knows. Um, so he's great. The dogs love it as well. Next slide. Um, again, we manage uh, a bunch of different programs for the state. I encourage you to go online. Uh, you can download the green guide. You can pick one up at our office or at a park. It will tell you all about the programs and things that we do at state parks. AZStateParks.com. Next slide. And the very last one, we do a, a family camp out program. So for folks that maybe aren't familiar with um, tent camping, we sponsor a program. Uh, you can go out in the spring or fall. It says sprint. That was my fault. Um, teach you how to set up your tent, how to build a fire, how to cook, how to put out your fire correctly, um, how to clean up in your, your campsite. And we do uh, cleaning programs at the parks. Um, uh, invasive species removal and trash cleanups and things like that. So it's a great program to teach new families about outdoor responsible uh, activities outside. And last slide is just a thank you. And that's me. Uh, so if you need to get a hold of me, you have questions, uh, we would be happy to um, to give you some information and remind you to just go to the website, go out and enjoy our beautiful state. And thank you for your support of, of water and uh, education and keeping us uh, safe and healthy out here. Thank you so much, Gecko. <laughs> thank you so much to all who joined us today. I added a few links to the chat. Um, the ADWR YouTube page for those interested in checking out last year's webinars, um, the Water Awareness Month website where you'll find a lot of information about Arizona water resources and events throughout the state. And the link to our next webinar will have Dawn Collins, also from the Arizona State Park, talk about um, Arizona State Park as well uh, in a different way. And let's all celebrate and protect our water resources every day. I will also um, provide an opportunity for Gecko to answer some questions that we have in the chat. Uh, we have one here from Rebecca. Are all parks open year round? How can we make a reservation for a campsite on your website or through a third party website? So uh, every state park have its own rules and regulations, opening hours, camping rules, et cetera. Yes, so we have 15 camping parks around the state. Most of those uh, we showed you here, um, they are, um, available for camping up to one year in advance. So you can go on our website and reserve it. You can also call. We have a call center that's open seven days a week from eight to five. They will help you find a site at a location if you're not familiar. Um, so uh, different parks have some different hours. There's a few different regulations and rules, uh, but for the most part, the outdoor kind of camping parks are pretty consistent. It's like any other kind of campsite. So. Thank you. We have an extra question from Lynn. Which park is the darkest and best for viewing the night sky? That was a great question. Um, so Oracle State Park is uh, our first dark sky park and Karchner Caverns is our second. Uh, the Grand Canyon's another one here. There's a few other locations in Arizona. Um, I would say Oracle is probably the darkest because it's protected by the mountains from the light in Tucson. So if you head down, it's about two hours uh, south of Phoenix, a um, uh, little bit off the I-10 freeway before you get to Tucson. Um, they've got uh, star parties there again uh, throughout the year. This time of year is perfect for it before it gets too warm. Um, they do presentations and bring out astronomers and telescopes and you can check out the amazing skies above Arizona. Thank you. And we have one more question. Why is the website a dot com and not a dot gov? Because I maintain the website. No. Um, we, we worked in conjunction with uh, the folks at tourism and game and fish because we kind of support the tourism aspects of the state uh, rather than making it a dot gov, making it more of a, maybe a, an industrial or purely government based website. We did it as a public facing kind of promotional tourist based website. So the dot com makes us more accessible for folks. Um, and we do provide all of our, our legal uh, government agency information is also on the website. We just don't have to break it out as gov or com. So. 
Thank you, Gecko. We also have a few comments and feedback. A lot of people happy about the presentation. I see that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah we... check out the whales, go out and have some fun, bring your friends and family, and we appreciate you guys' uh, support. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we don't have additional questions, but feel free to reach out to Gecko or let us know if you need his contact information. It was in his last slide. This presentation will be available on the ADWR YouTube. And with that, we'll end and everyone have a great day. All right. Thank you. We'll see you in the parks. Take care. <laughs>